Good morning and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for October 22nd, 2018. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is urgent problems and mostly open solutions with Jeff Spees. Jeff is the founder of 221B LLC, a strategic consulting firm combining expertise in research technology, methodology, and workflow to accelerate projects across higher ed. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Um, I recommend that you select the, uh, the option to send your question to the panelists and attendees so that people can see your questions as they come in. So, uh, and you are welcome to type during the presentation. I will be tracking them and we'll take questions at the end of the presentation as well. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Jeff. Jeff, welcome. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for having me. Uh, I have presented uh, to this community before and it was one of my favorite presentations, um, uh, the CI community before, and it, it was one of my favorite presentations because of the feedback I got. So um, uh, please do uh, ask questions. Again, you can uh, add them to the chat. I'll try to keep that up on my screen as well. Um, I'm happy to have this be interactive and I would like a lot of discussion. So I, just a little bit about my background. Um, I, and I hope you're seeing the slides. If you're not, um, someone shout at me. I, yep, we can see them. Very good. So uh, just a little bit about my background. Um, I sort of come from three disciplines, uh, computer science, statistics, and psychology. So my PhD is in quantitative psychology, but I've always, I, I, as an undergrad, I, I studied computer science and psychology. I was in a, at Notre Dame. I, I started off in a joint, mass, a joint PhD program in computer science and quantitative psychology. Quantitative psychology is like behavioral statistics. Um, uh, I followed an advisor to the University of Virginia where I finished my PhD and they didn't have a joint program, but um, I continued uh, I, uh, really working in technology in that space. And, and my dissertation project was the open science framework um, uh, and that uh, received uh, some funding and and from there uh, with that funding we were we were asked to start a center for open science uh, to continue to develop the open science framework uh, and so uh, uh, Brian Nosek and I founded uh, the center um, uh, and for uh, uh, five years um, I, I served as the chief technology officer I recently I uh, left that position in March to start this new uh, business um, where I'm doing a good bit of consulting, but I'm also working on some uh, products for the space uh, that I think uh, um, that take a different angle than the center uh, 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 takes with, with its uh, project management and curation uh, uh, framework that I developed in the OSF. Um, and a lot of that has to do with just a rethinking about the urgency um, by which uh, 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 we face these problems. And so I'll, I'll start with one of the big challenges, and that's that uh, by you know a, a sort of napkin calculation, 99.9% 8% of the world lacks access to and and therefore involvement in scholarship and science. Um, and a lot of this has to do with with access. Uh, uh, you search for a paper and you, you encounter, rather than the contents of that paper, you, you get a paywall. Or if you want the data behind a paper, it just, you just can't get it. Uh, uh, it's not shared and, and, or people don't want to share that data with you. You look for software behind, a, behind research and, and it's just not there. Or it's not curated well uh, uh, in a way that you can reuse it. Um, uh, and so this this is a, a real problem when we when we think about how big the problems we face are, uh, the fact that so, only such a small percentage uh, of people can actually work on those problems, well, to me that that's that's a big deal. So I, I've always been really motivated by the inclusivity that openness allows uh, when I think about the problems we face. Uh, so that's one of the big challenges. 
connected to that is there then a lack of diversity by those solving the problems or those with the access um, and usually that that's a uh, monetary exclusions but the 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 uh, capacity to actually uh, uh, or the resources to uh, contribute or or make use of uh, scholarship and science and that lack of diversity is actually a problem uh, for uh, problem solving uh, uh, we we solve problems better when when uh, we are working with a, a diverse group that diversity we bring in other points of view uh, uh, and other experiences that add to um, our ability to solve problems and again we deal with some pretty big problems in the world and so the lack of diversity is really you know it's, it'd be nice for everyone to be involved of course we want a diverse group to be working on things but it's also very practical in that um, uh, research efficiency would be better off if, if we had more diversity. Uh, a major problem is the fact that we are humans. Uh, uh, there's, there are psychological elements to this that are really problematic. Uh, and until um, uh, we can uh, get the machines to uh, uh, solve some of these problems without us, maybe that's not the greatest thing in the world uh, after seeing some of these Boston Dynamics videos. But uh, uh, we have to we have to accept that that we are human and we have certain biases and 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 uh, issues to contend with in our psychology and I'll, I'll take you through that. So uh, this is usually an interactive part of the talk. So feel free to to chat if you're if you're uh, if, if you like here. Um, what I'd ask you to do is look at uh, checker mark A and checker mark B. So the A and the B, and and and. Think about whether those are the same color or not. And if you think they're the same color, uh, say something uh, I, because we should we should chat afterwards because I've never had anybody see them as the same color. To me, they look like different colors. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the color of A and slide it down. Yes, if you've seen this before, Mark, that's that's good. Uh, so we we know you don't have. Uh, perhaps some cognitive uh, uh, issues to, to deal with there, yes. Uh, uh, so uh, if you did see them as the same color, I'd probably say you may want to go get your eyes checked. You might have something going on. Uh, but uh, I'm going to take the color here and slide them down. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, I see them as completely different. I've done this so many times, and I can't see them as the same. So I've taken a square, and I've slid it down, and A and B are in fact the same color let's go back to that different colors i cannot force myself to see them the same but if i take that square that swatch and pull it down between them they are indeed the same color so what's going on here well everything about uh, uh, this visualization uh, this uh, uh, illusion uh, uh, makes me think these are different colors um, there's uh, the local contrast of the grid. There's a 3D column with a right-facing light source that casts what, what is supposed to appear to me to be a shadow. I know it's a shadow because of the uh, fuzzy uh, edges. Um, the X junctions uh, suggest changes in, in uh, uh, surface color. Everything about this is telling me they are the same color, but they are not. They are different colors, and I, or they, they, they are the same colors, but I cannot force myself to see them as the same. So, so all of my experiences, my, my visual processing, everything I've learned about the world is telling me they're different, but they are not. Same deal. Uh, I would ask you what, what animals you see here. Usually someone would shout out frog. A few people would shout out horse. Uh, I, uh, I'd get some other random animal. Uh, 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 and if you sort of flip this around, you might see a frog, then you might see a horse. So different people see different things. Again, they experience this differently. And these are illusions meant to trick you. Uh, let me present something that is not an illusion. I want to present numbers. I want to present data uh, 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 that was collected by scientists and show you that this is a little bit, this is the science is hard. Uh, scholarship, we, we have a challenge. That's why we're in it. We're doing this because it's challenging. So 29 statisticians were asked the same question. Do a dark skin players, soccer players receive red cards more often than light-skinned players. So is there some bias involved? Uh, uh, so very simple question statistically, very 
quote unquote easy to answer statistically. Uh, and, and what we see is that those statisticians came up with very different things. Uh, some said that they were equally likely. Uh, others said twice as likely. Some people, two of the groups said almost three times as likely to receive penalties, red cards. And this is just math. This is not meant to, to trick us. So we're taking those same perceptions and motivations and biases and knowledge about the world and experiences we've had into our science, into our scholarship, and that, that causes some, some, some problems. Okay, on top of that, we have this skewed incentive structure, this skewed incentive system. So me as an academic, um, I, am, I am incentivized for, for publishing. I'm not incentivized for accuracy, so I'm incentivized on getting it published, not on getting it right. Uh, and, and what do I do? Uh, well, that leads to a publication bias because uh, I produce what is publishable. Um, uh, and, and I can't get away from it. This is just a, a human, human reaction to, to that sort of incentive. Um, uh, incentives to publish will lead to biases to produce what is publishable. So what is publishable? Novel results, positive results, clean results. What is not? Replications, negative results, mixed evidence, messiness. Uh, uh, scholarship and science is messy. Uh, I, I, and yet, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to give you a clean narrative, a nice story, because that is what, what, what will get me published. Uh, and so what do I do? I turn that into a clean narrative. I turn that into um, a nice story. Uh, one of the projects that, that we uh, did at the Center for Open Science was the Reproducibility Project, Psychology. We, went, we sought to replicate 100 studies in psychology. Um, reproducibility, by the way, that was a misnomer. Uh, uh, reproducibility is the act of, in this, by the uh, 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 one definition of reproducibility and replicability. Reproducibility is taking the data and trying to produce the same results. Replicability is holding methods constant and, trying to, and, and collecting data again that produce consistent results with the original. So actually collecting new data. And so in this replication of these 100 studies, 97% of those studies had positive results, significant results. There was an effect. They found an effect in that study. When we tried to replicate those studies, uh, we found that only 37% crossed that threshold, that 0.05 threshold. And in fact, there were many more that had p-values or this measure of significance um, uh, less, greater than 0.05. And this is because in the published, well, there are many reasons for this. One of those reasons is this publication bias. Uh, I, am not, I am not incentivized to, um, one, replicate my work, but two, um, produce negative results. And so I, 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 I search and I search and I search until I find positive results. Um, I tweak the data, um, I, I tweak my analyses until I find something positive, whether it's accurate or not. I'm not saying that everything here was inaccurate. Uh, the, the replication could have been in, inaccurate, uh, but, but it does uh, point us in a certain direction. This is consistent with uh, many fields in science that have run similar studies, including uh, um, biology, um, economics, and other, other fields. Um, John Clairbeau uh, and via David Donahoe uh, once said that that article is not the scholarship itself. It is, a, it is merely the advertising of the scholarship. And I think this is, this is, um, this is stuck with me because I, I think that is very true. You can't, you can't do much with that paper. It doesn't tell you much. Um, Claire Bowden and Donahoe were, were two of the uh, folks involved in that definition of reproducibility and replicability, by, by the way. Um, I, now on reproducibility, on the re reproducibility side, we see the same thing with pure science. Um, uh, Kohlberg and, and uh, 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 colleagues uh, tried to reproduce um, the software builds, the code builds, um, in 601 papers from ACM conferences and journals. Uh, and what they found out was that uh, of the 402 uh, papers uh, backed by code, uh, For 30, only 30% were they able to build, obtain the code and build it within 30 minutes. Um, so, so how quickly were we able to actually get this thing running? 48% of the, of the uh, papers, um, they were able to manage to build the code, but it did require quite a bit of extra effort. 54% um, of the papers, um, uh, they managed to build the code, 
or the author said that it could be built with a reasonable amount of effort. So that means all of the other papers, they were not able to build. That is a reproducibility problem, um, especially when we think of, of the fact that, that scholars are busy. Um, I, I, this, that we're not really incentivized to make our, our work reproducible, to make it easy for others to use. Because why would, we, why would they? Um, you can't publish a replication, you can't publish a reproducibility study, um, and, and you can't publish, um, and, and publications want something that's novel. They don't want something that is uh, uh, um, uh, sort of just part of the extension of science. We have to sell it as novel. Uh, here's the diagram. It's an interesting paper if, if, you, if you're interested. Um, and, and this is consistent with, with other studies in the, in the field. Um, so if we, have, if we have code issues in computing, that's not looking good for other disciplines. So, you know, the paper is one thing, but now the software we have, we have issues with. Um, I, and we know how complex software is, and it's critical to, to so many aspects of science and scholarship. Uh, uh, this has to be an issue for other fields, um, probably by a dramatic margin. Um, and it's, it's, the issue is that this context, this critical context of the software, the analyses, the data is important. And it's, 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 it is the scholarship, and yet we're not incentivized to do anything with it, to, to uh, make sure it's accurate, to uh, wrap it up in a package that's reusable. There's all of these other aspects of, of the scholarship. Um, there's all these elements of the research workflow uh, uh, that, that, that go beyond uh, the publication uh, and such that if we, if we really seek to facilitate reproducibility, replicability, extension, reuse, we're going to really need to move beyond that, that paper, the description of outcomes, to really sh you could describe process or better share the actual process, share that thing that runs on, on other people's computers, for example. Um, uh, we can't keep the focus, focal point of, of science and scholarship on this, the publication. I know there's fields that are different where publication is not as important, uh, but uh, uh, for the most part, you know, that is the focus. Uh, but there's all of this other stuff that's critical. And the incentives are even worse here um, because of, of how we view um, uh, others work. And so uh, if you, if you, if Anderson and her colleagues, they, they asked scientists, um, uh, do they subscribe to the norms of science or the counter norms? So the norms being things like open sharing and uh, uh, being motivated by knowledge and discovering rather than treating science as a competition or evaluating research by reputation, quality versus quantity. Um, uh, and they ask them, what do you endorse and, and what do you subscribe to? And most scientists, uh, this is the, the light gray bar, uh, most scientists endorse more norms than counter norms. Of course, they believe in evaluating research on its own merit and considering all evidence, even if it goes against one's prior beliefs and quality versus quantity. Um, the hash bar is, in, uh, is those scientists who endorse an equal number of norms versus counter norms. And the black bar is endorsing more counter norms than norms. So that's very rare here. Um, we then, they then ask them, uh, okay, what, what do you do uh, in your own research? And, and what, what they said, well, it's not quite as simple. They, you know, may, maybe they do fudge a little bit. Um, and then the kicker, what do your colleagues do? And boy, uh, uh, they believe their co colleagues lie, cheat, and steal. Uh, they believe their colleagues really subscribe to those counter norms more than those norms. And so if we think about all of these incentives to um, uh, produce what is publishable and this competition that I believe my colleagues are doing this, it's hard to imagine that, that uh, uh, someone could uh, uh, really uh, uh, get past this. I, I, can't. And if I was doing substantive science, I think I would, I would be guilty of these same deviations in behavior, um, the same fudging uh, uh, that, that we, we, we have seen. Uh, now, if you think more about that accuracy that's impacted by this, um, uh, those good journals, the ones with the high impact, good, quote unquote, good, those high impact journals, the ones that are very highly cited, uh, we've seen that uh, evidence that accuracy is actually negatively correlated with impact. The better the journal, quote unquote, better the journal, the lower the accuracy. Uh, a lot of this work has been done by uh, John Ioannidis uh, and his colleagues. Um, here, the rates of retraction and p-values are positively correlated with impact factor. 
the more impact factor, the, you know, the better that journal, um, the higher rates of retraction, the higher the number of errors. Um, statistical power is, is uh, uh, negatively correlated with impact factor. And what we know about power, power uh, having the, uh, uh, being impacted by uh, sample size and effect size, both of those things lead to research findings that are less likely to be true. And so we have, we now, not only do we have this bias to publish, but even those, how we evaluate those publications has the strong bias that it's, it's less accurate uh, than, we, than we think. Okay, this is even worse. Uh, here's, a, here's a study of, of 100 uh, universities in China um, that reward, uh, uh, looking at uh, cash rewards for publishing in certain journals. So nature and science are two of the best, two of the highest impact factor journals. I, I use the word best, but highest impact factor journals. Uh, I, in 2016, the average cash award for a paper published in, in a nature science journal. So every nature science publication got a $43,000 reward, almost a $44,000 US dollar reward. Compare that to the average salary of a faculty, $8,600, or the, or the salary of a junior faculty, $3,100 a year. That is a huge incentive to do what it takes to publish in a high impact journal. That is a huge incentive, and it's, that is not just China, and that's not just cash bonuses. This happens in the U.S. Here's a, here's a study of the US, UC healthcare system. For every 10 publications, after controlling for all these variables, like specialty and institution and rank, uh, the UC healthcare system saw a 2.4 increase in salary for every 10 publications. This is happening all over, this publication bias. Uh, this is a very strong incentive. And all of this is in contrast to the urgency. Here's a study uh, from comparetrials.org. They looked at clinical trials. They looked at these trials that people are waiting for, who, who their lives are on the line to produce results. Um, uh, uh, this is not some esoteric scholarship. This is, this is medicines and interventions that will save their lives. Uh, and, and what they find out uh, is that uh, I, the, the trials were not you know, these are supposed to be these, these very meticulous, these, these trials that were done in a certain way. You report, you say what you're going to try to find, and you report the results exactly. Um, when they look at these trials, only nine of them were, were uh, uh, perfect. Um, out of the 67 they checked, 354 outcomes were not reported. We don't know what, what happened to those outcomes. Uh, 357 were silently added. Um, uh, when, when this group uh, sent letters to editors of these published journals, only 18 of 58 of those letters were published. Uh, 32 were rejected by the editor. They're not even willing to update the, the uh, scholarly record to say, oh, there, there might have been an issue here um, uh, with this paper. Um, that is a huge problem. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Can more peer reviews help improve the accuracy of the content in a paper? That's a very good question and one that we don't know. Um, uh, I, I would say, uh, I, yeah, we, we don't know. We, we, for a long time, have stuck to a pretty traditional uh, system, you know, of three, approximately three reviewers. Um, we don't know if more reviewers would help. We don't know if open reviews would help. Um, uh, uh, and we really can't break into that system for reasons that you'll see later on. Um, but there are efforts to try to study this um, because we don't know for sure. We've just accepted that it, that it does produce good results. Um, I would su assume, like in open source software, that the more eyes on the paper would help improve the accuracy. But the problem is that those eyes come in after the, after the work has been done. And so what we really need is review to happen earlier in the process, like in software, so that it can actually change the way that that, that software was developed or that study was conducted. Um, it's sort of silly that we do all of this review after the work is already done, uh, at which point the researchers certainly are not incentivized to uh, accept those, those, that, that critique, uh, because it's just basically saying your work that you've already did is wrong. And so we have a lot of problems with peer review, but there are groups in, uh, motivated to, to change that. That was a good question. Um, more on the urgency, um, uh, you know, I could produ produce similar statistics for, for any number of diseases. 
Uh, malaria causes 429,000 deaths per year. 92% of that are in sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, uh, differentially in certain parts of the world, we, we see uh, these deaths. Um, uh, we are making progress, but what if we can make more progress? What if the rate of decrease uh, of, of, of malaria deaths could increase at a fact, faster pace? Shouldn't we be striving for that? And what I will suggest is that openness and, and uh, uh, or uses of, of openness or, or um, uh, uh, sort of that mostly open concept um, uh, will improve these rates. It will make science more efficient, will make science faster, higher quality, uh, more collaborative. And so this is, this is really the, the goal. Now, uh, yeah. Excuse me, we just got a question here. Can the research community tolerate negative peer review? Uh, yes, that is, that's a, a very good question. Again, uh, I don't know. Uh, I, right now, because that is, happens at the end of the process, a negative peer review is, is really problematic. I mean, especially if you're getting cash bonuses on that, that, that means you're not going to get that bonus. Um, uh, uh, so I, I, think, I, I think they, I suspect they can. The values are oriented towards collaboration. It's just that the incentives are not. So I think if we would, if we can start changing the culture, um, uh, uh, making it less punitive and more uh, 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 of a positive, I think they 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 can tolerate that critique. But right now, that's a, that's a really it, it impacts one's career, one's professional success. Good, good question. Um, so a, a, a common uh, question that or argument that I get against making things more open. Um, is that, well, maybe there's only 10 people in the world that can really understand my work, much less re reproduce it or extend it. Uh, but that's an that's a, that's a odd way to think. Uh, if I'm wrong and one more person can extend that work, I've increased the effort that I've dedicated to the problem by 10%. So, and that's, that's one person out of this 99.9%, 8 8% of the world without access. That, that is a bold statement to say that, that um, uh, I don't need to do this because there's only a few people that can really use my work. I think that's a, that doesn't give credit to the work that we're doing, to the, to the, to the, the change that we're trying to, to make in the world. Um, okay, now a lot of this, because of this publication uh, process is such an important process, you know, this peer review process is so important in, in, in academia, um, for years, we've gone ahead and just signed away our copyright. We, we sign away our copyright when, we, when they publish those papers, um, uh, closed access, and, and we give them exclusive license to the content. It's no longer ours. Um, uh, and this is particularly urgent because this lock-in, this, lock this vendor lock-in, this getting the copyright, this sort of stripping you of all your rights is the dominant business model in scholarship. Um, and what is happening is these businesses, these large publishers who make uh, 30 to 40 percent profit margins um, that the, the prices just keep increasing every year after year um, uh, and trying to deal with them even at institutions like MIT or Harvard is 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 uh, near impossible Chris Berg at the MIT libraries the director of the MIT library says it's like bringing a cardigan to a knife fight she has no leverage by which to uh, negotiate uh, with these publishers because they already own the content and so we have to stop giving away our content like this. And why this is particularly dangerous is because they're going after the rest of the research workflow. Um, uh, and this is critical. Uh, uh, the rest of the research workflow goes way beyond text. Um, uh, it goes to the data and the software and the analytics around that. Um, uh, here's a digital science uh, from sort of a pseudo publisher in this domain. Uh, uh, they, this is one of their marketing elements. Uh, they are, um, they are working with repositories and, and software across the research workflow. Uh, and those things will work very well together, but then trying to get into that will be very difficult because it just doesn't, uh, um, uh, it's, it doesn't sit well with their business model. Um, uh, they want that lock in uh, so they can dominate the entire research workflow. When you have that, you can charge what you want for it. Um, uh, and we can't, we, we can't, we can barely afford the cost of text right now. I can't imagine what it's going to be like when uh, we, we have to buy back our data or our analytics um, or other information. And this information, we can do a lot with text. 
Google has demonstrated that you can do a lot with text and data and these things. Um, uh, and that's just sort of free text. Just think if this was structured, the sorts of knowledge discovery that could be, uh, knowledge discovery engines that could be created uh, to try solving these problems, to finding uh, uh, in this big data set, to finding um, uh, uh, solutions that we never even thought of, making click connections, finding relationships in this linked data. Um, uh, it's, it's, this, is, this is really dangerous because they will own this ability. We will not. Uh, and that means innovation will be stifled. That means um, uh, uh, less people will have access to this really society level changing technology. So what do we need to do? We need to make things as open as we can. Um, I, and so dealing with delayed dissemination, inaccuracy, lack of reproducibility, lack of replication, exclusion, um, openness allows for rapid dissemination. I can just make my work available. I'm less biased uh, uh, in the results. Um, I'm accountable, which makes me less biased. That helps fight that bias, um, helps me fight motivated reasoning. Um, uh, it's easier to, to reproduce things when it's available to reproduce. It's easier to replicate when the methods are available, when I can see the, the analyses, when I can see the code. Uh, and then it's, it is a core piece of inclusion. It doesn't equal inclusion. Uh, we still need to facilitate that with education and, and training um, and, and some, cult, some pretty big culture changes. But it is a core aspect to inclusion of making this available for others to um, at least uh, uh, try to uh, take part in. Uh, my suggested solution is that funders just need to require it. It's their money. Uh, uh, they need to require openness uh, where openness actually matters. Where there's value add, they need to require that. Universities need to reward it. We need to change the tenure and promotion system. We need to uh, uh, change what, what, is, what is it really that a publication means. If high impact journals are correlated with less accuracy, then why are we being so rewarded for those top public, quote unquote, top publications? You can't see my finger quotes here, but I'm doing a lot of finger quotes. Um, publishers need to facilitate this. Now that goes against their business model. Um, uh, uh, so value aligned publishers need to facilitate it. Open access publishers need to facilitate new publishers. Publishers are thinking about new business models other than selling content, selling services around content. Um, they need to be thinking about how to facilitate this. And researchers, we just need to do it. Doing it is easier said than done, of course, because of our lack of time and, and all these incentives. And so I think we have the, the, uh, we are the least flexible in this, I, I, I suspect. Um, uh, and, but we, we do need to be working on this. So, and, and that, that speaks to sort of the strategies that I'm, I'm proposing. And uh, we just don't have time to wait for the culture change it will take for researchers to get on board naturally. Um, uh, one, people are dying and, and our work can help that. Uh, it's just a matter of fact. Uh, we, will, we can make research more efficient um, uh, uh, and we should do that. We should be compelled to do that. Um, and these, this, these, these publishers who are very savvy uh, business uh, folks, um, they're coming at the rest of the research workflow. They have text, uh, they have us in a bad position with text and they're going after data. They see the value of data. Uh, they see the value of, of analytics and software and, and methods. Uh, and they are, they are going at this full steam. Uh, and so I just don't think we have time to wait for that culture change. And this is where the stakeholders that can immediately move incentives need to do so. And that is funders and policymakers. We need some top-down solutions here. Yes, researchers can keep working. Uh, we can see this sort of grassroots, bottom-up revolution taking place, and it's fantastic, and it's been exciting to be part of and see. But uh, uh, it's it's this is too urgent. We're gonna we're, we're going to have lost by the time uh, uh, we get there. And lost, I mean, we will have lost uh, this critical uh, piece of um, uh, of infrastructure and and ecosystem, which is the rest of the workflow. Now, to convince those funders and policymakers, we need to demonstrate the ROI, the return on investment of openness. And I don't think we're doing a very good job of that. That's one of the things I'm, I'm working on uh, in this new business is, is uh, uh, trying to make that much more um, uh, tangible, make that much more uh, compelling to, uh, to non-academics. Uh, you can say, well, openness leads to more citations, and it, and it does. Um, but uh, a citation is really, you know, it doesn't mean much. Uh, we don't know what a citation means. Yes, it's sort of like it's 
uh, uh, that the work's important, but um, uh, it, 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 that's a very loose definition of what a citation means. Uh, and so we need to be thinking about, for example, how many lives does openness save? How many, how many medicines come out uh, uh, or how much faster can we get through the clinical trials process? Um, uh, how many inve interventions are created? How, many, how much do we learn about uh, education policy? Um, you know, anything that just that gets at quantifying or qualifying, you know, what our scholarship is supposed to do, which is, I think, for the most part, make uh, the human condition better. Um, yes, that's a good one. How many fewer rockets explode on the launch pad? I love it. That's a, that's a great one. Um, uh, these are things that, that um, uh, we need to really work on. And part of the problem here is that researchers need partners. They lack those incentives and they lack time. Um, uh, those, those partners, uh, I, I, I see them in the library, for instance. Librarians and archivists, um, they bring a lot of expertise that researchers don't have time and don't have, don't have and don't have time to develop. They could, be, they could be facilitating, doing these things that they don't, researchers don't care about, improving metadata, uh, uh, improving reproducibility, um, uh, making things open. Uh, I see this in the, in the infrastructure community, the, the technology community, the IT community. Um, uh, uh, there are all these partners who have all this expertise and rather than trying to, you know, force researchers to develop that expertise themselves, why don't we, you know, collaborate? Well, collaboration is not really incentivized for the most part in academia. We want sole author publications. Uh, if you have more than five author publications, everybody after the first author becomes at all. Uh, we, we just have these little incentives that, that make collaboration not so great. But we need to change that. We need that expertise. We need that diversity and inclusivity. Again, I, I hate to throw a problem in my solution uh, time here, but generally speaking, those people, those technologists, the statisticians, the methodologists, the librarians, the archivists, they get less respect and recognition from researchers. And so we do have this cultural problem. But here's where funders and, and policymakers can just say, like on your grant, name your librarian or archivist who's gonna help make your work open. And name your technology partner who's gonna, gonna help make your work more reproducible. Containerize it, dockerize it, make virtual machines, whatever that is. Uh, and this doesn't have to be this revolution. I think we should start with resource solutions and nudges. So fund this stuff, but fund small incremental changes. Let's develop that ROI. Uh, this doesn't have to be changing everything all at once. Um, I, I, and that's, that's sort of that, that incrementalism, I think, is, is what we need to be thinking when we think about openness, because there's still, we have to be practical. Not everything can be made open. It is time consuming to make things open that is also reusable and extendable. Um, that structure metadata, that uh, curation, that is, that takes a lot of time and resources. Um, I, I, dealing with confidentiality, uh, for example, which I'll talk about, um, I, I, that, that, you know, some things just can't be made open. Um, I, maybe some things aren't worth being made open. If there's all of this, this sort of garbage that exists in our scholarly record, maybe some of those things we don't need to make our open. Uh, so we really need to study the ROI of, of openness. Um, but we need to take a practical incremental approach to it. Um, so uh, confidentiality, not everything must be open. How about auditability for some use cases? Uh, for the, that, those, those cases where the data is, uh, needs to be secure or private, and that's for, for uh, protection reasons, protecting uh, uh, human subjects, for example, uh, protecting uh, private health information, for example, um, uh, protecting IP even. Um, uh, why we, we need to think about auditability. Um, Here's where the hash is a beautiful thing. Uh, uh, I, I won't explain hashes in detail, but they're basically fingerprints for data. So this first uh, uh, piece of data, the string data integrity and distributed systems, is plural system and the other is not. They have vastly different hashes, and that is the property of a hash. Um, and in knowing, nothing, knowing the input tells me nothing of the output. I can't invert this. I can't get back knowing the, that the hash is D7781157, et cetera, I can't tell you what the original input was. And so how about just publishing hashes, for example, as a way to uh, deal with auditability. As I collect data, publish the hashes of those data. 
um, timestamp them. And if anybody ever questions the validity of that data, the accuracy of that data, we can go back to the hashes and, and check to see if it's changed. Check to see if there was a problem with the data. Um, secure multi-party computation. Uh, this is a really neat uh, area in, in computer science um, I, I, that often starts with this basic question. What if a set of millionaires want to know who's the richest in a way that doesn't reveal their net worth to each other? Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a way of, um, uh, uh, and this is really dumbing it down, but encrypting the communication protocol uh, such that um, uh, the data can be shared and you can analyze against that uh, encrypted data set um, uh, and get a result uh, but not uh, know what that original data is. And there are ways to get back to the original data and some protections have to be put into place. And that's what this field of secure multi-party computation uh, takes care of, but it's basically encrypted comp computation. Uh, uh, and it's, it's, it could be a way to sort of get at that incremental openness. Um, uh, we need to be thinking about sustainability. And that, that is, I, I don't mind uh, hearing about profit margins, 30 to 40%. Uh, uh, ever increasing uh, after uh, the digital revolution in public publishing where um, you know journals are not being sent all over the world PDFs are being shared I think is a little a little strange and we need to question whether we want to be giving our copyright to those groups um, uh, but uh, uh, we need to welcome commercial and non-commercial entities uh, into this space um, uh, uh, we want I want to see that innovation so but how do we bring openness there? Well, we need to develop open protocols and infrastructure that allows both those groups to play together. And that's probably moving to a more service-based um, ecosystem rather than selling content, we sell services on content. And if those, if those services can speak in open protocols, we can still have that inclusivity while still maintaining some IP rights uh, to one's own service. Uh, and here we need to make use of distributed and decentralized technology. Um, I, I, that's going to be, uh, you know, it, it's already, a, a, you know, a, 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 this is in the news all the time with blockchain and, and uh, yes, I'm sorry, I will talk about the blockchain just a little bit, um, but uh, I, I, we can make use of these things. Um, I, think, I think this is a pretty uh, blockchain friendly uh, community <laughs> in terms of data provenance. Okay. Very good. Yes, it, it's a, it's a, it's, it's huge for provenance, and we can use that. And I'll, I'll mention that in just a little bit. Um, we need, as a tool, as tool developers, we need to make tools as easy to use as possible. Uh, researchers just don't have the time to learn things. They don't have the time, they, and they don't have the incentives to learn this stuff and, and fight software, or even, even just learn to use decent software. We really need to make tools as easy to use as possible, lower to the barrier to entry meet the researchers where they are in their current research workflows. Um, don't make them have, you know, adopt a new workflow, try to integrate those tools via protocols and interoperability. Um, this is the sort of the fair data perspective. Um, uh, uh, and maybe not just make them easy, make them automatic. Researchers don't even need to do anything. You can just automatically dockerize a, a workflow and, and, and share it. That is the way to, to um, uh, see uh, uh, this, culture change to see a move to openness. If they didn't have to do anything, they just got it for free, basically, that is that, that, then they will do it. I will, then I would do it. If you make it easy and, and almost automatic, then I would do it. Uh, and this could come in the form of, you know, even in like a repository, you, you, I upload some data, it does a scan, a reg, a, you know, a regex scan, regular expression scan for social security numbers and the ID column. And it says, uh, it looks like you do have social security numbers in your ID column. How would you like to proceed? And it, and it tells me to do something, or maybe it notifies my security professional at my institution who can then help me with this, or it doesn't allow me to share it until I do something about it. Um, these are the things that we could do. And these are, this is what I mean by research workflow integration. At the point of me uploading that, this should pop up and tell me something's wrong. Um, I shouldn't have to, you know, send this somewhere else. Uh, wait three days, get the data back in a re PDF report, and then do you have to do something with it? This is research workflow integration. Now, whether you use Clippy, I'll let you decide. Um, maybe not the best idea for ease of use, but that, that's that's the choice of the tool developer. Um, and if we do this, we can get to this point where you know that research workflow is put into a system of continuous integration, quality assurance, tests are being run as things change. Uh, preservation practices are, are just part of that process. Literate programming, uh, 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 that, that sort of LaTeX or R Markdown style of 
building the analyses and data into the paper such that when those things change, the paper changes and it generates an online version of that for, for online commenting with something like hypothesis, um, some online annotation framework where we can get that, those reviewers, many more reviewers in where they can have that collaborative discussion and that doesn't have to be at the very end. That can happen during this process. Um, I think, I do think this is where we have to move. Uh, one more uh, sort of area to focus on, availability in an open workflow, thinking about those, those steps, those practical incremental steps. Uh, well, persistent identifiers are an important part of that. Um, URIs, uh, okay, they're not that persistent, but you could back them up. You can have policies related to them, ARC IDs, ORCIDs, handles, DOIs. Now, those are more persistent. Those have consortiums behind them. Um, hashes, uh, they're unique. They, they, they have some, these special qualities about them that they make good persistent identifiers, but we need to pair that with persistent content, and that's the availability piece. Um, uh, you know, there were these data refuge and data rescue events at the, at the start of the administration when we saw that, um, for example, climate change data and certain behavioral data was, was at risk for being removed or was removed from um, federal, federal websites. Um, uh, persistent content is just as important as persistent identifiers. We seem to think that just getting a DOI means that the data is persistent. Well, it doesn't. The, the reference to the data is persistent, not the data. And so we need that, we need that ecosystem for, for sharing. That's the, what the repository community does. And that's what they've been doing with Data Refuge and Data Rescue. Uh, but what if we go beyond that with, you know, decentralized systems and go old school mirroring networks or torrents um, or, uh, like I said, the blockchain. And that blockchain, uh, uh, as was mentioned, is a good system for provenance uh, maintenance. Uh, because what you're doing is you're hashing hashes. Uh, and the, the act of hashing a hash means if the original hash changes, the, the hash that it was built on changes. And so, because block 11 here is built on the hash of block 10, uh, if block 10 changes, we know block 11 uh, we, if, if block 11 ever changes, we know that block 10 had changed and vice versa. There is this, this provenance, this ledger system is important. Um, uh, and so those concepts I think can be used. Now, I've been holding other talk, you can probably find it online about uh, whether or not I believe this is the future of, of uh, scholarship. By the way, I do not. However, we can make use of the blockchain uh, by, for example, putting the identifiers in the blockchain in the data in distributed stores. And so make the bet, take, make, sort of make, use the best of both worlds. Uh, the blockchain is a really nice ledger, but we don't want to start putting huge data sets in the blockchain. We don't even want to put small data sets in the blockchain. It's already too big as it is. Uh, and so we can put the identifiers, those hashes in the blockchains, those points, those are uniquely point to content that might be stored in a distributed system. This is one way to do that. Now, it is for your community and community like yours that need to think about the security aspects of that, the availability aspects of that, the confidentiality aspects of that. But we can start using these technologies um, to try to then meet the policymakers and funders, hopefully, in, in assigning those requirements for certain aspects of transparency and openness. And if they had us as partners, technologists as partners, uh, uh, I think they would see this as something that uh, would be less burdensome to researchers than it is now. Right now, requiring openness, requiring uh, transparency is actually quite burdensome to researchers, and that's why they're pretty hesitant to do it. And so we really do, they need us as partners, they need the libraries, they need the technology space as partners to, to try to make that easier as they, as they bring in these policies. Uh, and that is, that is uh, uh, sort of what I am trying to focus on now, is trying to bridge that gap um, develop products that have more of this thinking that are that are less uh, re reliant on a cultural revolution and more on supporting policies uh, that can really uh, attend to these um, uh, problems in a, in a, in a much uh, faster pace. Um, that's it. I've had some great questions already. Uh, I'm looking forward to more questions here, but thank you for your time. Feel free to email me anytime. I'm, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff and I'd, I'd love to hear uh, more from this community. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to give the uh, viewers some time to type in some questions if they want to ask them. And so I'm just going to grab the screen back real quick. Great. And, um, and then uh, please, I want to encourage you all to take our survey. Uh, just let me uh, 
plop the link in our chat here. So uh, here, here's a link here, uh, to a Google form to take our survey. We would appreciate any feedback you could provide, uh, requests to present, or suggestions for presentations that you'd like to hear. Um, also, uh, next, our next webinar is actually going to be in December. We like to uh, push the, the, web, the next webinar to the, the sweet spot between the holidays of Thanksgiving and Christmas to make sure that we have enough people around who are available to, to observe the presentation. And so we're going to move our webinar to December 10th at 11 a.m. Eastern, and the topic is cloud security, and the presenter is Ryan Dooley. And for those of you who are new to the webinar series who are watching, if you want to learn anything more about the series or uh, look at old presentations, you can find us at trustedci.org slash webinars. And with that, uh, looks like we've got a question here. Yeah, it's a great yeah, I'll, I'll just read it. Go ahead, uh, please. Sure. How can cybersecurity professionals on campus incentivize slash encourage openness? Locking up our research results makes universities a target for attack. And we have an example of a phishing campaign. Yeah, that's a really great question, Jim. Uh, uh, and really sort of a great, um, I, and I, when I, I hadn't really uh, thought of it, uh, um, that we are more of a target attack when things are uh, when they when they are open when they're open they're they're available. Okay, so so I think that where the cybersecurity community can can help, um, I don't know on the incentives. I think certainly there's some people in this community that can help with the incentives, but I think we hear a lot of excuses from the research community that my data must be uh, it, it must be protected. And I hear this from almost everyone, and, and only a few of those cases have I ever thought, yeah, okay, it should be protected. We just have this, this intuition that it should be secure, protected. Maybe, maybe that's for personal gain, like IP protection. Uh, maybe that's just sort of not understanding aspects of security. You know, there's not that balance of like, what is the risk versus the reward? And so I think the cyber, infra the, the cyber security uh, community, the, the cyber infrastructure community can really sort of be sort of helping uh, uh, researchers find that balance. Um, uh, and it's what you do. It's what, what, what the cybersecurity community does is, is really work with that balance. And, and, but that is a hard thing to understand for most people that don't, uh, that don't really understand those concerns. And so I think we can develop tools that make that easier to deal with. Um, I think we can uh, be thinking about education in that way. Um, because it's such an easy excuse to go to of I can't share it because it's protected. Um, and again, um, even if you can't share all of it, you can, there's things you can do that you can share, that you can provide auditability, for example, um, uh, that would, would really make a difference on the accuracy and the quality of the research that would start defeating some of those challenges that I mentioned earlier. So there's, there's actually a lot that the cybersecurity community can do, um, uh, and it's really to help us move past this excuse of, well, my data needs to be secure. I, I, I can't tell you how often in my, my consulting now I hear someone say, um, well, my, my, I work with human data, and so it's, 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 I need to, the, the repositories need to be HIPAA. And they don't, they don't know what it means. They have no clue what that means. They just, they just have sort of heard it somewhere, read it somewhere. It does, there's no HIPAA uh, compliance necessity. They, they have no clue what that means to begin with. But they just they just had heard human data HIPAA, uh, uh, and now they're talking about these things being being the same. And so there's a lot of education that, that needs to be done, or or better, a partnering. Um, I think we need to see more partnerships between researchers and and the cybersecurity uh, community. Uh, great question, Jim. Really, really great, and and I, I like that. Um, I like this example. Uh, so then we've got another question here. It seems like some of the biggest accomplishments we've had in science and technology is through open competition. And she follows up, like we need to be able to openly criticize and inspect and test and publish findings. In InfoSec, we need the research community to be able to continue to publish code vulnerabilities without being penalized or jailed. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, that's an, this is another good example from this community. Uh, and, and I would love to, to talk more about this because I only, you know, I, I uh, have, a, have a sort of a cursory amount of knowledge here, but um, 
I, that, that is a good, good, good uh, example. Uh, you know, what it, I, I think it sort of came with some of the open source, uh, um, uh, the move to more open source, which we still have a long way to go there, but um, uh, we have seen a lot of benefits in the security domain uh, by being able to uh, publish vulnerabilities and, and interact in, in this way. Um, uh, now there are these cases where uh, penalization happens and, and that, that's, that's a real problem. That's what I would love to learn more about. So Susan, follow up with me, send me an email. I'll, I'll type my email again. Um, I, but yeah, this is, this I think is, is exactly where we, you know, science and scholarship works on, it, we, we have this saying, standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, by definition, it's collaborative. By ne definition, you extend one another's work. There, there's this idea of a public corpus, at least in public science, there's this public corpus that is so important. That's what a citation really is. Um, uh, uh, and we, we've seen good use, good examples of that, like the Human Genome Project. Um, but it is unclear whether, the, for example, the Human Genome Project, one that was built on principles, core principles of openness and transparency and, and immediate release of data, um, whether that was openness that did that, uh, that had such a game-changing uh, effect on the, on the science, or whether that was just, you know, well-resourced collaborative science. And so uh, we need to really get into that ROI question uh, because it's not as, openness is not as intuitive to some people as others. Um, Susan, you followed up with, with open source, we can show real benefits. With closed vendors like Oracle, we have to rely on a vendor that has shown a lack of integrity historically. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of cases of this and, and, and there's just, you know, when it's closed, we can't say a lot, we can't do a lot. Um, uh, it limits our ability to innovate. And that's, that's, that is the analogous problem in, in science and scholarship. Uh, we had another question coming in between those uh, comments. What might, the, what might be the options to address the paywall issues for life science journalists? This has become a major barrier for life science research. Any good solutions? Yeah, so this is this is really uh, you know of the of the open revolutions that are occurring. Open access has been been around for a while. This is trying to uh, move journals to think about other other uh, ways of monetizing content um, or sustaining their their journals um, for those that are working at a sustenance level rather than a profit level. Um, so. So yeah, so first of all, uh, again, I, I don't know, uh, I've had to, to you know, I've, I have uh, some family that are going through some hard health issues and, and friends and I've, you know, uh, I've had to go to the ER for, for, for certain things, a, a bad headache uh, uh, and tried on my mobile phone to Google symptoms or do I really need a, a, this scan or, or that um, uh, test or whatever it is and hit those paywalls and be, been very frustrated and I have access, I do have access to these things. And so we need not only is it so not only is it a barrier to researchers here at, at large universities in the U.S., but our smaller universities and then certainly other folks from other countries they just can't do the research. And then citizens who want to use that research or research hit these hit these literal barriers, these literal paywalls. Um, uh, and and who wants to rent access to the article for you know seventy eighty bucks a day? That doesn't it just doesn't it doesn't make sense. Um, so the options to address that I think are one, um, uh, we can we can try to support publishers who um, uh, don't put paywalls in front of their content. Um, uh, uh, now there's several types of open to to try to combat that. There's Gold OA, which is charges a, a, uh, author processing fees, author processing charges, um, where the authors pay. Um, I prefer um, uh, trying to find a sustainability model. Um, uh, perhaps institutions supporting these journals, um, maybe uh, um, moving public publications into into the institution, uh, into the university presses, um, such that there be no author charges or uh, uh, subscription charges. Um, uh, I think that would that I mean that that is the solution there. Um, now, how do we do that? That's a, that's a, I think the, the question that a lot of groups are trying to ask. And so, um, is that flipping these journals? So telling institutions, Hey, you pay this much, um, or you pay a lot in a bundle for this journal. Um, uh, you could just pay that directly to the journal itself. 
uh, and maybe they could then sustain themselves. And then we could make um, uh, the, the, the research completely open. Um, I think there's, you know, there's public funders who could, who could mandate in their contracts with researchers that they not publish in, in closed journals. Um, for any federally funded researchers, research, we have the public access policy that does make that content openly available. But even that doesn't go, you know, it's a public access policy. It's not an open access policy. And so, uh, you know, the licenses are ambiguous. There's some work to be done there. Um, I, uh, but this, this stuff deserves to be in the public. Uh, uh, again, the, the, the issues are, are just too urgent. And so um, uh, we need to be thinking about different business models for publishers. And if they can't um, evolve, um, then, then we need to question the role of publishers in 2018. Great question. Uh, yeah, I'm, I will leave the attendees uh, time to ask one more question. So I'll ask a question uh, myself. You had mentioned uh, encouraging people to name uh, archivists and other people who will help keep the research open and public in the grant application. Do you know, uh, have you, are, you, are, are you talking with NSF program officers? Are, are they wanting to initiate a type of culture change where they ask for this type of information? No, that this is one of the, uh, I, I presented this to a few groups of funders and, and all with very positive uh, uh, response. I, I don't know about NSF in particular, uh, and if there are NSF folks out there that want to talk about this, I'd be happy to, um, or, or if uh, others want to, you know, raise this at NSF, that'd be great. Um, you, you know, I think there's, there's this question of, I think there's this deeply rooted question of whether openness is worth it. Um, uh, and a lot of times those, those funders have been researchers themselves. They know of the, the constraints and, and the culture that, that we operate in and, and they know what it takes to be professionally successful. Um, and so uh, um, even with their good values and their goals of making the world a better place and all of that, um, they have these, these sort of human biases to contend with as well. And so, um, uh, in, but in terms of uh, an easy practical step, one question on, on the, the publication uh, saying name that person who's gonna help make it open, um, uh, that is a huge one. The same thing with tenure promotion policies. We're not seeing a lot of uh, uh, changes to, to uh, uh, that process that would encourage openness. Uh, we don't even, we don't even see the policies themselves openly. There's an effort to collect the, that data just to make that transparent. Um, another question that could be asked on a research grant would be um, provide the URL to your, to your department's uh, tenure and promotion policy. They don't need to do anything with that. They don't need to penalize uh, groups that don't have uh, openness uh, as an incentive in pet promotion and tenure, um, but just make just suggesting to researchers that at some point this will be of interest i think would go a long way and so just you know one or two questions here or there i think it would start the it just it's a nudge it, it nudges us into the direction of saying oh well maybe i should be maybe for my department who relies on nsf funding maybe we should be thinking about having a statement about openness in our promotion and tenure policy uh, maybe we should include uh, the libraries or archivists or, or uh, 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 technologists, uh, statisticians, uh, other, other uh, service providers in the, in the grant um, uh, so that they know we're serious about these things that seem to be important to them. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, we have one more question. We'll take, we'll take this last question and we'll wrap things up. Uh, does research workflow integration need cooperation from the data owner provider, uh, mainly to decide how to understand the data to identify some sensitive info. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, there's some easy stuff that would could be based, you know, on on heuristics. And that example with Clippy that I showed, uh, you know, uh, a regular expression actually goes a long way to, to identifying IP addresses and social security numbers and name but regular expressions maybe not but there are there are, there are ways to detect names um, email addresses these are things that um, uh, just slip into data all the time uh, 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 um, 
and it's very easy as you're sharing the data to, to forget that you have IP addresses as one of your 40 columns and it's, it's, you know, I don't know, A8 in uh, your, your spreadsheet or X, whatever they do, XY in the spreadsheet, uh, and you, you miss that it's there. And so um, uh, some of that we can do heuristically. Uh, and we, we, should, we should start doing that. We should start uh, trying to do that. Um, other stuff, yeah, we do need the uh, data owner, the data provider to be involved. And that's where that partnership happens. Um, having a meeting with uh, a, a professional uh, would go a long way uh, uh, to, to say, you know, uh, uh, you tell me what these things are. Or, or if they would work, we're working with the libraries um, uh, or archives, um, you know, the data would come with a code book, uh, descriptions of the, the data, of the, of the variables, a data dictionary, for example. Um, uh, and that could be sent, you know, one, those groups, librarians and archivists, have the expertise uh, in, in some of this to, to um, uh, help understand what is sensitive and what's not. Uh, but if it did have to go to a security professional, that, that data dictionary could be sent to them, and that person could review that, you know, in parallel um, to what the researcher is doing. So um, I think there's cases for both, and that's going to be the – that's, again, where um, it's so important for this community to be involved because uh, we can make it easier, we can make it automatic, and we can partner um, to move things forward in a, in a positive direction. Good question. Well, Jeff, I just want to thank you so much for uh, presenting today. And um, I want the community to know that I will be posting these slides later and uh, a link to the video. Um, do you have any final comments or thoughts? No, thank you so much. Uh, this was great. These questions were, were fantastic. Uh, I'm going to export them before this closes. Um, I, uh, please do uh, uh, send me an email, uh, jeff at 221b.io. Um, if you have any other questions, this is sort of a whirlwind tour through the challenges and solutions, but I'm happy to uh, hear more feedback um, or just chat about this stuff. So send me an email and, and uh, um, I'm ha happy to chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you. Okay.